morning. I'm so glad you're here today. What a great way to celebrate my birthday. <laughs> I hope we don't have a repeat of last year. Uh, last year, the Chairman Beacons got up here in morning service and presented me the gift of a new suitcase and four new tires. <laughs> he told me to take a hint. Oh, no. Elvin, I see you coming with a uh, suitcase. I'm running. Uh, but what a great birthday present. Just to fellowship with you and be here with you. I tell you, I got a birthday shock this morning. I want to introduce my four best friends, and I mean that literally. Um, the, uh, Jamie and I have been friends for 50 years, literally. And the others, we've been friends for 35 years. Uh, Jamie Sharon. Now, uh, Jamie's husband was my Sunday school teacher for a couple of years, so everything I know comes from her husband, Fred. But we grew up at Southland Baptist Church in Memphis. And then Angie Cranford, the beautiful blonde here, uh, we've been friends since I was at First Baptist Church of Oliver. Always had a crush on Angie, and I, I really kind of still do. I hate to do it. Uh, then her mother, Linda Cranford. Uh, and again, we've been friends for 35 years. Linda makes the best biscuits and chocolate gravy in the world. Oh, I would give anything for some of that right now. And then Betty Stewart in the pink. Uh, when I was pastor at First, uh, no, no, I've never been a uh, pastor of First Baptist. Uh, when I was at Porter's Creek Baptist Church, my first church, I used to eat with Betty and her mother every Sunday afternoon. Uh, they were great cooks and still are, and I would go there and eat and take a short nap. So they mean the world to me. I know you probably thought they were a traveling singing group. But they're really not. <laughs> Some of you might have thought they were a pastor search committee, but I promise you they're not. None of them would want me. That's a, that's a sure thing. But I am so thrilled. I tell you, I'm just glad to have all of you here. Let me make a couple of announcements. Remember the chili cook-off is tonight. If you don't want to bring chili, just bring up some cookies or dessert of some kind. We will provide all the trimmings for that, and we will crown a chili king or a queen. Next Sunday, none of you should be sleepy in church. I don't want to see any yawns. I don't want to see anybody nodding off, because you'll get an extra hour of sleep next uh, Saturday night. Don't. Don't just stay up an extra hour. Go to bed at your normal time, and you'll all be awake, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, remember the bonfire and the hayride at the Go Forths and Voorhees of uh, Ponderosa? We're going to have a great time November 8th at uh, 6 o'clock. Ladies' conference, this is going to be terrific, and you ladies need to go. Operation Christmas Child, you see the announcements about that. We still have a couple of boxes left, I think, Sheila. Yes. Uh, so let's try to fill every one of them. In gathering day is the 15th, which is three weeks from today. And you see there's some uh, coupons there. You can go to Hobby Lobby and buy anything you need. Uh, December 1st, we're doing our shopping trip to the Tanger Outlet in South Haven. Then we're going to stop and eat at a good place on our way home. So all of you are invited to that. Any other announcements we need to mention? Yeah, choir today at 4. Okay, choir today at 4. Uh, got to half of our children's choir here today. They've got my seat. I'm ready for them to hurry up and sing and move. <laughs> uh, also, uh, continue to remember the family of Finest Wilson who died on Friday. His funeral will be uh, Tuesday at 11. Uh, visitation is tomorrow night. So you've been praying for many and their family. He's one of the sweetest men and a great conversationalist. I really enjoy being around him. So you pray for all of them. It was a really a tragic situation. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of a new day. We sent your presence here. I almost feel like I'm going to remove my shoes, Lord, because I'm on holy ground. Uh, I know that you're at work. I sent your spirit. I pray that we'd not do anything that might quench your spirit or grieve your spirit, but help us to worship in such a way that it's a, a pleasing aroma in your nostrils. Uh, I pray that you would bless the word as it goes forth today. This is such, a, I think, an important message, 
Uh, and I think it's needed as we can uh, consider our presidential election a week from Tuesday. Uh, may none of us, Lord, go in there without having prayed first. Help us to pray before we do anything. And help us to respond, Lord, to your leadership. We offer this service up to you. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is a joy to be back in the church this morning to worship with all you good people. It's good to have Miss Shirley on the piano over here. Uh, Jane was supposed to be on a vacation this weekend, but they canceled. But we already had Miss Shirley lined up to play, so we're just so glad that she's doing that today. And uh, always had, glad to have Kim over here on the other instrument. So let's stand and we sing together. We're going to begin with Jesus Loves the Little Children.
that the children's choir is going to be singing for us. Been looking forward to this for a while. I want to thank Kim and Lori for uh, doing this. They're gonna, the first song they're going to sing, you're going to have to listen fast because a lot of it's fast. So. And then they're going to do one that's a little bit slower. So uh, I'll listen to these children now. I think you're going to be blessed.
I've been so excited about this sermon. I, I never sleep on Saturday night before church, but I really didn't sleep last night. According to my Fitbit, I slept three hours and 16 minutes last night. I just preached all night, and I'm ready to roll this morning. And if you'll just give me about 38 minutes, hopefully we'll have a good time together. I'm going to be uh, reading some verses from Jeremiah 8. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire chapter at the outset, but keep your finger there because we will be referring back and forth to it. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, again, I thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word. Uh, but Lord, I'm just the messenger. It's not about me. I don't want anybody here leaving thinking, what a great preacher. I want people leaving thinking, what a great God we serve. And I pray that you reveal yourself and your authority and your compassion this morning. Lord, we don't believe that uh, it's the end for our nation. We do believe that there's hope. But there's got to be a revival, a turning back to you. And I pray that it would even start right here and spread throughout our country, our state, our nation, and ultimately the entire world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thousands of years ago, uh, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes made a statement. He said, there is nothing new under the sun. In other words, some things just never change. They are always the same. If we could resurrect Solomon this morning and have him walk the streets of any major American city, I think he'd be amazed at our architecture. I think he'd be amazed at how fast the pace of life is. He'd be amazed with our transportation. In those days, most people never traveled more than five miles from where they were born. Most of you drove more than five miles to get here today. He would be amazed at all the conveniences we enjoy and our medical advances. And the free flow of information, sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's bad. But then Solomon would open the newspaper, or he would turn on the 5 o'clock news, and he would read and see that last year we exterminated the lives of 862,000 unborn babies. Then he would read that 64% of American men view pornography on a regular basis. Two-thirds of all American men. And there's no appreciative difference be between believers and non-believers. He would read that pornography is a factor in half of all divorces. He would read and see with his very eyes the fact that it is virtually impossible to walk some American cities after dark it's just not safe. He would read that violent crime has increased fourfold in the last generation. He would see with his very eyes that in many places church attendance is virtually non-existent. There are areas, especially in the Pacific Northwest, with only about 3% of the residents ever attend church. He would look and see how the people of God are, are mocked and ridiculed and ignored. Some people see us as objects of compassion. All oh, those poor people, they're so deluded. They bought into this fairy tale from the Middle Ages. I think I know what Solomon would say. I think he would say it's really true. There is nothing new under the sun. I have seen all of this before. Things really haven't changed all that much in 3,000 years. This chapter illustrates what I'm talking about. Jeremiah was an unpopular prophet. He was known as the weeping prophet, although there are only three references to him crying. But he weeps over the spiritual condition of the people. He preaches to the southern kingdom of Judah. In 922, the, the united Israel divided. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Northern kingdom fell to Assyria 
in 722 B.C. and, and basically uh, became uh, of, of vanished into oblivion. The southern kingdom was called Judah. It eventually fell, and we'll get to that in a minute. But Jeremiah addresses the southern kingdom of Judah. It was rife with sin. And this is a blistering indictment of the way they live. He warns them judgment is coming. But they are totally unaware. In those days, Judah's, uh, Judah was the most prominent and prosperous country in the world. Had a gigantic army. Had the most uh, fertile ground. Had more money than every other country combined. People looked at that and they just assumed, well, God must be pleased with us. Things are going well. We're living high on the hog. Surely that is a sign of God's approval. Jeremiah comes along and upsets the apple cart. He said, yes, on the surface, everything is great. But you're not looking below the surface. You're like an iceberg. You see 10% of it above water, but there is 90% that you've not considered. You've laughed at it. You've ignored it. Judgment is coming, and you better get ready. Jeremiah addresses some specific sins that he observes in the country of Judah. There's a total disregard for the commandments of God. They are satisfied with things just the way they are. They do not want to change one whit. There's religious ritual. People just do the same thing week in and week out, and it has no meaning. It's just done out of habit more than devotion. There was a very corrupt government, a government that mistreated its citizens, a government that confiscated all sorts of money and land and so many people were became homeless because they had, had had to give up everything they had worked for. There was prosecution of the prophets. Anyone who dared stand up and address national sin was shut down immediately. There was a society where children were thrown away. The king's father, Manasseh, had introduced the practice of child sacrifice. He led the people to worship a pagan god named Molech. And Molech believed that as you threw children into a fiery pit, that somehow earned you credit with Almighty God. So thousands of children were thrown away. There was gross idolatry. People worshiped their money. They worship their illicit relationships, etc., etc. Jeremiah spoke these words in 600 B.C. Now, do you know what happened just 14 years later? In 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, was surrounded by Babylon led by Nebuchadnezzar. You've heard of him. They surrounded the city. The city eventually fell and the entire country became the possession of the Babylonians. And it was that way for about 70 years. So judgment was right around the corner. But the people didn't recognize that. It just failed to register with them. They said, man, things are great. The economy is roaring. Surely God is pleased with us. In chapter 8, Jeremiah just bam, 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 bam asks a series of questions. A machine gun style. He's like a prosecuting attorney in a, in a court trial. And he asks a series of questions really pointing out the people's sins. These are called rhetorical questions. A, a rhetorical question is a question where the answer is obvious. You know, you pull up on a a car accident. You get out and ask the question, did you have a wreck? <laughs> no, we just want to drive around with the car looking like this. <laughs> Obviously, it's a rhetorical question. These questions, the answers are obvious. Obviously, the people couldn't answer the questions because, as I said, they're blistering indictments of their lifestyle. First of all, 
there is a question, and, and I want to just connect it to America today, if you'll let me. There's a question for the American public. Question for the American public. Look at verse 5. Why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem in perpetual backsliding. They hold fast. They cling to deceit. They refuse to return. Uh, another way to answer or interpret this, why have these people fallen into sin? And it doesn't mean anything to them. It was gradual and they just not even noticed because while they were singing and dancing their lives away, sin was introduced. And like a cancer, it grew and grew and grew. It took a man like Jeremiah to come along and remind them that they have turned their backs on God. There's an interesting word usage here where Jeremiah says, why have these people turned away, slidden back? That is the Hebrew word shuv, S-H-U-V. 99% in the Old Testament, shuv, means to turn to God. It's a, it's a word for revival. The people gave up their sin and they made a definite turn toward God. Well, this is one of the couple of times it's used negatively. The people have made a negative turn away from God. God had established them. God had given them blessing after blessing, but they had just disregarded Him and made a sharp turn away from Him. I can imagine God asking the same question of us this morning. Make no mistake, contrary to what you'll hear on the average American college campus, this country was founded on biblical principles. It was founded by men who acknowledged God. They weren't exactly evangelical Christians, you know that. But they were men who acknowledged God's leadership and they established a country built upon the principles of the Word of God. They established a country that was a shining city on a hill and still that's what God expects from us. Uh, in, in spite of our, our ancestry, in spite of our founding, much of America has turned away. That should not be. People need to know our American history. Did you know all 50 state constitutions, they have a preamble, and all 50 of them make reference to God. The Tennessee state uh, constitution begins like this. We are grateful to Almighty God for the blessing of liberty. Uh, Arkansas state constitution reads this way. We, the people of the state of Arkansas, grateful to Almighty God for the privilege of choosing our own form of government. If you had an extra hour to sit here, I could read every preamble and point out to you that everyone was built and established upon the recognition of God. Did you know that Harvard University, established in 1636, in its charter, its founding document says this, our purpose is to lead students to know God through Jesus Christ who is eternal life. Princeton University, established in 1746, the charter requires all faculty members to be convinced of the necessity of salvation in Jesus Christ. Dartmouth University, established in 1746 as well, was founded to train missionaries to the Indians who lived there in New Hampshire. William and Mary, established in 1693 in Williamsburg, it says in the preamble, the charter, we exist to propagate the Christian faith. Columbia University in New York City, established in 1754, their charter says the chief Thing that is aimed for in this college is to teach and engage students to know Jesus Christ. I don't have to remind you, every one of those institutions 
has become a bastion of liberalism and secularism and humanism and the name of Jesus Christ is belittled. And believers who attend school there are ostracized and every effort is made to change their attitudes and their old-fashioned ways of thinking. We've turned away. We live in a society where Christianity is, is at best tolerated. At worst, it's ridiculed and swept under the carpet. Why have we turned away? I read across this th this week. You might be interested. Uh, the Gallup organization uh, released the re results of an exhaustive study. In the 1940s, these were the seven biggest problems in school. Talking in class, chewing gum, making noise, running in the halls, cutting in line, dress code violations, and littering. I mean, doesn't that seem simple today? Today, the seven biggest issues in American schools, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery, and assault. Why have we turned away? Jeremiah wants us to answer that question. So there's a question for the American public. Number two, there's a question for the American pew. That's you. That's us. Look at verse 14. Why do we sit still? We assemble ourselves. Let us enter the fortified cities and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God has put us to silence. He's given us drink of uh, given us water of gall to drink because we've sinned against the Lord. Let me just kind of pick up on that opening question. Why are we sitting still? You could translate it. Why are we doing nothing? Why are we just watching with disinterest the way our country is, is uh, just uh, being uh, destroyed right before our very eyes? You have heard these quotes. Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. Dante, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a great moral crisis remain neutral. We are in a great moral crisis. I know that's a real news flash to you. You know that already. It, and it's easy to blame the drug dealers. It's easy to blame those who are, who are so lawless and they, they commit arson and they loot and riot all in the name of, of uh, racial equality. You know, there's one thing to protest. I applaud that. It's another thing to riot and loot and burn. And it's gotten totally out of control. We see a total lack of authority. Uh, you know, we see an out-of-touch Congress. And, you know, we could blame them all day long. But, you know, most of the blame uh, really ought to lie on our shoulders. Many of America's problems are the result that believers have not been salt and light in their community. Salt has healing qualities. You've heard the term pouring salt in an open wound. That's a reference back to the days when salt was a medicine. We're a medicine to a sick society. When we're called to be light, it means we provide illumination. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil, Jesus said. But we provide that illumination in the shape of our relationship with Jesus Christ. The, the worst business meeting I ever moderated it was the world-famous business meeting where a proposal came from the kitchen committee that we raise the price of a carry-out meal by a quarter. It was $275, and the recommendation was that it be raised to $3. I want you to know people went berserk. We fought and argued for $40. Five minutes. I really initially thought they were kidding. I started laughing, but no, they weren't kidding. There was genuine 
anger there, and it was all directed toward me, which is fine. I've got a thick hide, but, but you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't have a problem with an extra quarter. But they fought and feuded for 45 minutes. I want you to know, during the time that we were fighting over a quarter, in some apartment complexes right behind the church building, a man came home high on meth, killed his wife and 11-month-old baby. I mean, 50 yards from where we were sitting. You know, the Christian life, it's not a cruise on the love boat. The Christian life is assuming your place on a great battleship for the glory of God. And let's be just as concerned about the outside as we are the inside. Let's not just sit here and watch our nation disintegrate before our very lives. So there's a, there's a question for the American public. There's a question for the American pew. But then there's a question for the American politician. Verse 19, listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter and my people from a far country, is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? The people are crying out for leadership and the king is off on some adventure trying to enrich himself. The king at the time was Josiah. Josiah started out bringing great glory to God. He was a good man and provided moral and spiritual leadership. But eventually he fell away, fell into idolatry and open mockery of God and the things of God. And people are just crying out for leadership that just wasn't there. Even today, people are crying out for genuine leadership for those who are in positions of authority. Did you know that the United States is not a democracy? I want to just clear that up right here. It is not a democracy. If it was a democracy, 313 million people would be voting on Judge Barrett tomorrow. And by the way, I hope she's confirmed. Uh, we are a republic. That means we elect people who vote in our place. We trust people to go to Washington or Nashville or the Haywood County Courthouse to vote in our stead. That's why it's so important to research the issues and the candidates because we need leaders who seek after the face of Almighty God. They don't lead by polls. They lead by conviction. There was a presidential candidate a few years ago who conducted a poll to find out what color clothing he ought to wear. He wanted to make sure he looked like an alpha male. There was a, a recent president who conducted a poll on where he should spend Christmas. Should he go to Hawaii and stay in an $8 million Oceanside Manor? Or should he go someplace else and commission a poll? We ought to have people who lead by conviction. You know, when, when Harry Truman left office, he had a 22% approval rating. I mean, he had no friends, no support in Washington, even from his own party. Nowadays, Harry Truman is considered one of our greatest presidents because he led by conviction. He was determined, I'm going to do the right thing regardless of what other people say. You know, we're just so swayed. Uh, the Bible says, you know, we're like sheep without a shepherd. We wander away and we just listen to any voice that comes along. I read about a, a science fair project uh, conducted by a young fellow named Derek Barnes who attended Capitol High School in Boise, Idaho. Best idea for a science fair I've ever heard. He began a crusade to eliminate dihydrogen monoxide. And everywhere he went, he preached against dihydrogen monoxide. He said dihydrogen, uh, uh, I didn't say monoxide, can